All right, if you would, turn to John chapter 8. And uh, one of the things I want to say before I go into the text is if, if you bump into someone that you know is a sinner, how do you react? I want you to think about that for a minute. Let's, let's say that this person was a churchgoer, this person was someone who God had called and, and done some great things with, but now they're not who they used to be, and you bump into them. I'm not looking for the political correct answer in your mind right now that is probably saying, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, man, we just love them in Jesus, hallelujah, just love them in God. I'm not looking for that answer. Like, seriously, when you bump into somebody that you know is in sin and you know that they at least know who Jesus is, how do you react to that person? I wanted to open up with that question because we see this story played out in front of Jesus' very life. And it's found in John chapter 8. We're going to start with verse 2. Now, early in the morning, he came again into the temple and all the people came to him, and he sat down and he taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Interesting. Verse 5. Now Moses in the law. Somebody say law. law. Say it again. One more time. Yeah, it didn't help. Yeah, I was about the same all three. That's good. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. Here they are, and they're bringing this lady to Jesus, and Jesus is teaching. I mean, you've got to really paint a picture here because here Jesus is teaching right in the temple, and they, it's, it's almost like Jesus is teaching in a setting, kind of like we're in right now, and someone, some of the staff of the church, right, bring a lady in that had been caught right in the act of adultery, which is very interesting. You know, like, who called her? How do you know she was caught in the act? Oh, yeah, you were there. That's great. Okay, so... They, they come in, they bring her up on the stage, throw her down in front of Jesus and say, how are you going to deal with this? Now, here's what I think the issue is in this story. Because we're in a series called No Filter, right? I believe the law had become the filter. The law had become the filter. And, you know, we knock Pharisees and religious people and all these people throughout scriptures. Jesus calls them hypocrites, all of those types of things. But if you think about it, they were only acting the way that they had been taught to act. You ever looked at someone and maybe passed judgment on them or, or maybe looked at the Bible and said the Bible said something different because you were taught that the Bible said that? Oh, now y'all's going to get quiet on me? Okay, that's cool. Th this is the situation that Jesus is dealing with, and all they knew was a filter. All the don'ts and the can'ts and, and you can do this, but you can't do this. And you can do that, but you better not do this. And, and here's what happened. They had been veiled all their life. All their life, there's this veil right in front of them blocking them from who God really was. But there was this law. There was this thing that we can look at today and go, oh, well, thank God we don't have to deal with the law anymore. We're going to talk about that a little bit later in the sermon. But these religious leaders had hijacked the law. They had taken the law, and they had added their own rules and traditions. Have you ever seen somebody that would take God's word and then add their own rules and traditions to it, and then get mad at you because you don't follow through on what they think the Bible says? Okay, Sandra, it's me and you today, girl. Come on, put your phone down and let's go. Come on. And, and here's what happened. They had developed an external filter. It was all about the facade. When Jesus would look at them and say, you're like whitewashed tombs, pretty on the outside, but full of dead men's bones on the inside. Just a facade. Come on, we do it too. We do it too. We have filters all in our life. We, we try to look like something that we're not. Heck, I got a picture to show you because I think this is what, this is part of our filter life. Come on, throw it up here. Come on. Some of y'all before and after filters. Y'all know, come on, quit pointing. I'm just saying, 
you know you look like this, but you post in this. And, and when you post it, everybody goes, Woo! I seen that girl at Walmart the other day. She ain't looking nothing like that. Come on. Woo! We, you know, because why? We, we always try to be someone we're not. It's a filter. Go, go on. I think I, I've sent you a couple more uh, things there. No, oh, there, there's your one. Yeah. That's actually what we probably look like. Go to the next one. Um, that there, yeah, go to the next one. That's that. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Jill. <laughs> You're going to have to live with that in about 15, 20 years. <laughs> but this is, have you ever done that old filter? It makes you look older, right? So I did that, and this makes me look this old. This was actually probably uh, 50 years from now. Keep going to the next one, but this is what we think we look like, right? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> this is like, oh, yeah, now that's Jamie. Now, that boy right there, now that is who Jill fell in love with right there. I'm going to tell you. She couldn't resist. Go to the next one. I got a couple more just for funny, right? There's your one. Hello. What was this? Is this TikTok or something? All that Snapchat, all that sinful stuff. Yeah, go to the next one. Yeah. Oh, hey. Hey, girl. Hey. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And those are real chains, by the way. That's not a filter. She blinging, she blinging. Go to the next one. Yeah, check this one out. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. What you doing? What you doing? Now, y'all know we do not look anything like that, right? I think they got another one, right? Oh, yeah, there's your one. Yeah, let's quit. Now, that are, that's not a real chain, which it was funny because Jill's chain looked just like that. It was hilarious. Go, I think there may be one more. Oh, y'all can't handle that. Quit. Pull that thing out. What do you? Stop that. I sh <laughs> yeah, and you need to get to the altar right now in the name of Jesus. Get down here. I'm going to help some of y'all. <laughs> I pulled up some social media stuff because this is a very heavy sermon. Because you do understand that in today's culture, that this story would have been all over social media. Y'all know that, right? Y'all know that some of the Pharisees would have done got Instagram. Could you imagine Pharisees getting Instagram? Come on. They, they would have posted a picture of, of Jesus sitting on a stool teaching, because that's what we've seen in, in Sunday school class, right? Jesus sitting on a stool teaching, and this lady sitting in front of her, or maybe on the ground in front of him, and, and they would post something like this. WWMD, what would Moses do? Come on, somebody. What would Moses do? What, what would Moses do? What would the law do? What would God say, right? Hashtag, we add it early. Hashtag, synagogue life. Hashtag, tithing ain't easy. Come on, somebody. Or maybe it would have been the churches that had the little picketing things. God hates adulteresses, and they're picketing. Or what about this one, because this one will get you really riled up. God hates gays. Picketing. What would Jesus say about the church life today in some context and form? What would Jesus say to you and how you or me, how we approach people who have sin in their life? Because the truth is, if you have to belittle or run down someone to make yourself feel good, you're in bad shape. If you have to look at someone else's sin and you think that the sin that's in your life or the sin that used to be in your life, and I know you done got your life all cleaned up and you're really good and you're like, you're like perfect, you're Miss Princess when it comes to, to the church world and life, you're king, queen, whatever you are, I understand that God's cleaned you up and you never have ever sinned since the day you gave your life to Jesus. I understand that. But what about the people who may not be like you? Are we going to look at those people and say, hey, because they're not like me, what you going to do with them, pastor? How are you going to address this situation? Because that's what they were saying to Jesus. 
I mean, because by the time that Jesus shows up on the scene, these people had produced a heartless, a cold, and an arrogant brand of righteousness, self-righteousness. I'm better than you. How many of you know I'm not better than anybody? I'm no better than the lady right now that is selling her body and shooting methamphetamine in her arm. I am no better. I am no better. Do, do we understand that? We, we've got to get it in our psyche. And if we really want to see revival and God do something, we've got to accept the people who God accepts. Yeah. Come on. And I know that there's some out there, see, that, that's it, just accepting all that sin. Look, if I accept a person, I say this all the time, it does not mean that I approve of their sin. I don't approve of any of your sins. But I hope you don't approve of mine. We don't approve of anybody's sin. Sin is sin. If the Bible says it's sin, it is sin. We're not candy coating the gospel, but we are reaching people where they're at, not where we think they should be. Ooh, doggy, that boy's up there preaching today. But keeping the law, man, it, it had become so oppressive. It had become overwhelming. It was burdensome. That's not who God is. When someone comes into the fold and into Christ, it shouldn't be burdensome for them to go through the process of sanctification, of being made whole. I understand that God delivered you on day one of a drug addiction, but God may not have done that for them. How are you going to walk through that with them? Are you with me? I understand God did this and this and this, and because I sold out to God, God did this and this and this. Well, I get that, but they're not you. This lady was not them. They hadn't been raised from birth to be a Pharisee and a religious leader. This lady was just going through life, and here she is, caught in the very act of adultery, brought in front of Jesus. And we see this happen. John 8, 5, it says... The B part. But what do you say? Yeah. Jesus, what, what do you say? And the Bible says this they said to him because they wanted to test him. Right? They wanted to test him that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down. I love this about Jesus because he's such a character. He stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. Ignoring him. I've always been, been intrigued to find out one day what in the heck was Jesus writing in the sand. You know what I think would be hilarious that Jesus was writing in the sand? The name of the prostitute that the Pharisee had just laid with himself. Mary. If your name's Mary in here, I'm sorry, but Mary... Come on, do you understand? Do you see what I'm saying? See, but here's, here's what you got to understand, and here's what they didn't get about Jesus, and this is where we're going to just kind of flow into a teaching moment. Y'all ready for this? In Scripture, in Matthew chapter 5, won't come up, chapter 5, verse 17, it says, do not think, Jesus said this, he says, do not think that I have come to abolish, which means to dissolve or to destroy. Don't think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. But I have come, or, or no, he says, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So Jesus, when he shows up on the scene, because here's what we do. We say, Old Testament's done with. You only got to live by the New Testament. And I get that. All the blood of blood, uh, goats and rams and bulls and all the stuff that they would have to do to sacrifice for their sin, we no longer have to do that. But is it okay today to murder someone? No, Jesus took it a step further. He fulfilled it. He said, look, you, you want to talk about, let's talk about the law. The law says you shall not commit adultery, right? Jesus said, let me take the law just a step further because now I'm here. I say to you, if you look upon a woman or a man and lust in your heart, then you have now committed adultery. You actually don't even have to perform the act now. So you want to talk about how Jesus didn't just do away with it. He came to fulfill the law. He came to bring grace to the law. 
Mark chapter 7, I love this text. Mark 7, 6 and 7 says, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you, you hypocrites? This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. He's saying, hey, I've already dealt with your kind. I already understand. Because when Isaiah the prophet began to prophesy about people like you, your lips are close to me. Oh, hallelujah. I praise you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I tell you what. Let me tell you what they... Isn't it? He said, your lips, your lips are close, but your heart is so far away. You got to quit doing lip service with Jesus and start getting your heart right. That's what that means. We, we, not just you, we, we have to get our hearts right with God because if we don't have our hearts right with God, guess what's going to happen? Somebody's going to come up into our midst and we're going to judge them. I heard a man say this one time and it was so simplistic and it just changed, it rocked me. It just rocked my world. He said, what are you, what are you judging sinners for? Sinning? If you judge a sinner, what, what, is your, what, what is the base of your judgment? Them sinning? Guess what sinners do? Oh, somebody said it. Guess what sinners do? Sin. What do they do? Sin. Say it again. Sin. Sinners sin. This lady had just been caught. See, you want to know why I think a lot of people continue to sin? Because they just haven't been caught yet. John 8, 7 and 8, let's keep on in this text. John 8, actually verse 7, it says, So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Let me read that again. He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. My friend, let me introduce you to grace. This is the grace of Jesus. This is, this is the veil torn down. Jesus did something in this moment. You know what he did? He brought grace and truth onto the scene together. There was grace, there was truth. The truth was this lady had sinned. She had been called in the middle of, of an adulterous act. I mean, that was the truth. But Jesus was there offering grace John 1, 17 says this. Check this out. It says, for the law was given through Moses. We know that, right? For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. I want you to remember that as we end this sermon today because grace and truth, where did it come from? Jesus Christ. Everybody today, there's a gospel out there today that's just preaching grace, 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 grace. That's great. But there's truth that always follows the grace. And we'll see that in a minute. On Wednesday morning, I began to struggle with what to preach this weekend. I had three different sermons. I was just cooking them. Pastor Kevin, you probably know what I'm talking about. You know, you just got three different directions. I could go this way. I could go this way. I could go this way. Where do I go? And, and by the end of the day, honestly, I was just frustrated because usually by the end of Wednesdays, I'm done almost with my sermon and, and I'm ready to go for the weekend and taking care of some other things. And, and I come to Hope Center graduation. If you've never been to a Hope Center graduation, get your tail out because it is amazing. It's great, and it started at 7 o'clock on Wednesday night, and I'm still kind of struggling, and if you were a pastor, you would know what I'm talking about. Until you get it done, Pastor Kevin, until you get it done, it's, on, it's in your head. You can't think about anything else. So I'm, I'm going through the, the, the graduation, and I've got all kinds of things going in my head. I get up. I reintroduce the three graduates uh, to their families. I pray over them. Uh, it's at, right at 8 o'clock. My son goes to bed at 8 o'clock every night on school nights, and and I wanted to get home in enough time to tuck him into bed. So I just kind of darted out. You know, they were fixing to dismiss. I wasn't being rude. I'd been here all the pre-stuff. And, and I was going out, and a guy grabbed me, and he pulled me to the side. Hence is where this sermon came from. And I'm not saying this to shame people because I don't know the people. I would never get in the pulpit to shame people. But I do want to lead us in repentance today. 
because the guy come to me and he said, I've got a bittersweet story to tell you. I said, okay, what is it? And he got to telling me how he had come to our church and how he was thankful for a church like our church. And man, I want to tell you, when you hear stuff like that, it does, it's, it's not pride that comes up or anything, but it's like, man, God, we're doing the right thing. We're doing the right thing. And he said, but here's the bittersweet moment. The people that brought me to this church just let me know that they're no longer coming to this church. And I said, oh, man, I, I just hate that. And he said, no, 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 no. They're not coming to this church because we have too many addicts here. Come on, don't you cast the stone. That's your brother and sister. Right? But it wrecked me in that moment. And I thought, God, I pray that we're never in a place to where we think we are actually better than someone else. And I pray for their souls. I, I, I pray, actually, to be really blunt and honest with you, here's, here was my initial thought when I was walking through the lobby to get in my vehicle. I thought, my gosh, I would hate to stand before Judgment Day with God. And God say, why, why did you leave the place that I called you to? Why did you do this? Why did you do that? And you go, well, there's too many addicts over there. In other words, there's too many people around there that sin, right? And it's almost like they label you. If, if people will look at me sometimes and go, you're an addict. Well, no, I'm a, I'm a blood-bought, believing, redeemed, delivered, sanctified saint of God. What the heck are you talking about? And that's cool that I got almost 22 years underneath my belt, but some people are still struggling, and they got a year, and then they fall off, and then they get another 30 days, and then they fall off, and then they get another. And then if we don't watch it, what we do is we bring those people up, and we say, you want to know why we don't participate? Because of people like that. That's why we don't do it. And we have rocks in our hand, and instead of dropping the rock, we start casting stones. When Jesus, when he came, he didn't come to cast stones. He came to roll stones. Come on now. And I know what a lot of us think, because a lot of us go, well, I would never do that. Really? 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 Because also on my way to the vehicle that night, God convicted my heart because just like they were saying that about an addict, I started having thoughts and things about them. And if it comes out and you know who they are, let me know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But God had to convict my heart and go, whoa, 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 back up. They're walking in their flesh. And I can't make spiritual decisions about people who are walking in their flesh. They're not who I am. They're, they're not holding the standard. They're not rising up to the level that they should be at. Okay, what are you doing to help them? Instead of pulling somebody and dropping them off and saying, I'll tell you what, we got a lot of addicts in our church. Why don't you go serve and celebrate recovery every Monday night? It'd be a good idea, right, Jamie? You'd appreciate that, right? So, so we could serve. We could help. We could lead a Bible study, a C group. We can have, we do one about addicts and say, hey, here's, here's God's delivering power, and here's the power of the Holy Spirit, and here's what God could do in your life. But if you don't watch it, you're just throwing stones. We're just throwing stones. John chapter 8, verses 9 and 10 says this. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. And when I read that, it, I actually wrote this down this morning. When I read it, it was like Holy Spirit just spoke to me and said they walked away, but they didn't change. It wasn't a heart change that they had. Their conscience got to them. Have you ever been in a moment where you go, ooh, I think I know that this is pretty bad, but you don't quit doing it? In your conscience, you go, oh, I come to the realization that I need to change this. But in your heart, you're not changing it because you like it too much. Okay. <laughs> All right. It goes on to say, and Jesus was left alone. Say alone. alone. I went back in the text and I thought, hold on a minute. Was the disciples with Jesus and I'm going back, and I, I can't prove that the disciples were with Jesus. I, I may could. I, I read 
uh, some, some text and stuff. But it was funny to me that Jesus was left alone. Even if his disciples would have been there, he who is without sin, throw the first stone. The disciples are going, oh, shoot. Because I have no right. Because there's only one man that's ever walked this whole earth that had the right yeah. and the opportunity to cast a stone at her. According to the law, Jesus could have said, sorry, girl. Let me tell you who I really am and how I came. This is going to hurt you. More than it hurts me. <laughs> and stoned her to death. But he didn't. And they go out, and Jesus is standing there, right? When Jesus has raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? Verse 11, she said, No one, Lord. Hold on a minute. She said, What? No one, Lord. She had recognized who she was in the presence of. She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Grace, neither do I condemn you. Truth, now go and sin no more. That's the gospel that's not really being preached today. The gospel being preached today is, neither do I condemn you. Hey, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not, Christ Jesus, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit of the living God. Hallelujah. And we'll quote scriptures, and, and, and we lead people deeper into hell by the covering of what we would call grace. When we say, neither does the Lord condemn you, now come and let us show you how you don't have to sin no more. Yeah, good. Whoever started that, I'm giving you a $20 bill after the service. Okay, <laughs> Kevin, I owe you way more than 20. I'll take you a good lunch. We'll go to Burger King instead of McDonald's. All right. But listen, Jesus didn't approve of this lady's sin. This is what we have to understand. He didn't approve of her sin. Here's how I know that he didn't approve of her sin. Because he went and told her, go and sin no more. He forgave her of her sin. You know what the law was built to do? The law. It shows us what God wants out of us. You know what God wants out of us? You know what God wants? Anybody? Anybody? Somebody said it on the front row. Holiness. Holy. It's another thing that's not preached well from the pulpit today. Nobody wants to talk about holy because holy's not popular today. Holy can't have fun is what the world says. So I'll come attend your church if you'll tickle my ears and say what I want you to say. But would you start telling me that I need to quit sleeping around on my wife? I'm done with you. I'll go to another church that makes me feel good in my sin. I hope and I pray we never become the church that makes people feel good in their sin. I hope and I pray that we'll be the church that allows people to come in with their sin and that it's the church that's not trying to clean people but get people in the presence of the cleaner. Come on. But the law, what the law does is it shows us that God wants holiness out of us. God's grace gives us the power and the desire to become holy. That's what grace does. It gives you the power. Man, you're like, well, well what am I supposed to do with grace? Man, just, just take it and just let it saturate your life and allow God to just come in in ways that you never thought God could come in. And I promise you, he will begin to cleanse you from the inside out. Not from the outside in. You're going to look like the same person for months. But before too long, you're going to walk into your office and they go, hmm, something changed about Mary. Oh, see how I pulled Mary back into the picture? You caught that, didn't you? Something changed about her. Three greatest words that I think that Jesus ever said while here on this earth was this, it is finished. And when the Bible speaks of him saying, it is finished, here's what happened. The veil of the temple, which was the filter, 
stopping people's access from, from man in the presence of God. The veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, which gave us direct access to Jesus. Come on, so if you're an addict in this room today, you have, if you've got Jesus in your life, you have direct access to the holy of holies, to the presence of God. Know you not that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost? Come on, don't make King James on you. Some of y'all should have been shouting and running around right there. So, okay, that's good. So I've got access. So that's, this is cool. So I'll just, I'll just keep on. i got grace. I'll keep sinning. I'm going to end with this verse, and then we're going we're gonna to come to the altar and pray for a little bit. Go to Romans 6, 1 and 2, because Paul dealt with this, and he dealt with this whole grace issue. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? One version says, so that grace may abound. He goes on in that specific version. I think it's the King James, and he says, certainly not. This one says, by no means. This is New King James. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? I want to tell you, my friend, when you get to the point where you die to sin, you won't live in it any longer. The only reason that it continues to stay alive on the inside of you is because you're doing CPR on that thing ever so often, and you're keeping it alive. You're putting breath into something that's actually killing you. And God wants to purify us, right? So what I want to do today, and, and I just want to go ahead and just go right into this. If our prayer team would come up just real quick. I want to do a call of prayer today. I want to call it a call of repentance. Because I believe for too long, even in our churches, this church, any church you can think of, I think for too long we've been carrying a stone around with us. And how dare we think that we're better than someone else? Because we're not. We're here to reach the world. Come on, are y'all with me today? Yeah. We're here to reach this community. You, you don't reach this community like this. You reach this community like this. I'm done. I'm going to accept people for who they are, and I'm going to teach them about Jesus. I'm going to accept them for who they are, and I'm going to teach them about Jesus. And they, if they continue to stay in that, I'm going to still love on them. And I'm going to still care for them because love covers a multitude of sins. And I'm going to win them to Jesus one way or the other. But I'm not going to condemn them. I'm going to allow Holy Spirit to convict their hearts. And if they're not convicted, I've just got to pray more of Holy Spirit on their life. God, would you just wreck their life? Would you help them, Jesus? Would you show them favor and mercy? Give them your grace. You know, that's the approach that we need to have. But a lot of times we don't have it. So every head bowed, every eye closed, just real quick. Maybe there's people in the room and you're saying, hey, Pastor Jamie, I, uh, I know what you mean when you're saying all that stuff. And I, I'm, I'm the person. You may not be an adulterer or an adulteress, even though I sense that this specific story is speaking to someone today, whether you're watching online or in this room, and you've been wondering if it ever come out, how would people react? You've just seen how Christ would react. Who cares how everybody else would react? Repent. Confess your sins to God. He's faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But if you're here today and you've got sin in your life and you need Jesus to clean you up, I'm not talking about wiping away all of the filth on the outside so that when you go back into the workplace tomorrow you look better on the outside I'm talking about a heart change and you know without a shadow of a doubt you need that heart change in you if that's you would you just slip up your hand real quick nobody's looking around heart change yes 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 thank you thank you thank you anybody else yeah thank you thank you sir see you up there guys see you right there yeah, keep your hand up. If you don't mind, just keep it up. Let me, see, let me see you real quick. Yes, yes, yes. Say this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, I confess my sins to you. And I believe that you died on the cross for me, rose on the third day so that I could have life and life more abundantly. So today... I give you my everything. Mold me and make me into your image. 
I want to be an imitator of you as a dear child. Thank you for saving my soul and for cleansing me of all unrighteousness. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Come on, give God a big hand clap today.